grave there is a land that Jesus went to prepare by his own hand and for the saved by grace there is a resting place in a few more days it will be mine some call it heaven I call it home, some call it dreaming, well let me dream home, some call it paradise, somewhere beyond the sky, some call it heaven, I call it I'd like you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Kings in chapter 18. We've been studying some Old Testament stories. And this story is about compromise. Now that's uh, a buzzword in the news media and in Washington, D.C. as we speak. So I thought, well, this would be an appropriate text. Before we launch, let's pray. Father, would you add your blessings? Now I do pray to what we're about to read and study and examine in your holy word. May it become very relevant to our minds and hearts. Help us, I do pray, to understand it with clarity as sent by your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, uh, <clears throat> Congress is at a crossroads. They can't agree on... Uh, a budget, and so they tell us the government is shut down. Well, at least in some respects, I wish it'd shut down forever. <laughs> Not in every respect, of course, of course. But in some respects, you say, yeah, that might be a good thing. But uh, the Democrats are fighting, of course, to get uh, illegal immigrants somehow included in a budget deal. I never have quite figured out how immigration and a budget should be on the same page. I never have quite figured that out. You know, It seems to me like that's two, two, uh, two totally different formats. And of course, uh, uh, Mr. Trump in particular is fighting for his wall, and so they're at an impasse. And uh, so the word that you hear most prolifically used on the news media as they interview one side versus the other side is, well, can't you come to a compromise? Well, compromise in some venues can be good, but in other venues, particularly in your personal life, it can be very detrimental. And we're about to see that as we examine this text. Now, there are some things I'm willing to compromise. Let me tell you what they are. Preferences. People need to understand the difference between a preference and a conviction. I can't compromise convictions. A conviction is something that's cast in concrete, ground in granite. I cannot depart from it. That's a real, bona fide conviction. And I have 
Not many convictions. I only got a few. A conviction is something that you should be willing to die for. That's why I don't want many. (laughs) You with me? (laughs) I don't want a lot of convictions. I'd like to keep that field narrowed down to just the, the, just the few that are absolutely necessary. Preferences, that's a wide field. I have all kinds of preferences, but uh, not not a whole lot of convictions. But a conviction is something in spiritual language in the light of the Word of God cannot be compromised. Just can't be. Or otherwise, it's not really genuinely a conviction. So <clears throat> we hear the word flung around on the news media now regularly about, well, the Congress needs to compromise. The Democrats and the Republicans need to come together. And all that kind of stuff, you see. Well, we're going to read about a fellow right here who was a king over the southern tribe, the tribe of Judah, you see. By the time we reach this point, Israel is a divided nation, the north and the south. Philosophically, it's a picture of modern America. You know, when you really stop and think about it. We not we may not be a divided nation um Politically, in that sense, we may not be a divided nation uh, geographically, but philosophically we are. We are. And there's the red and the blue and all that stuff that you've heard about. Well, <clears throat> Israel is a divided nation. The northern tribes are up here. They are sometimes referred to as Israel. Their capital was a city called Samaria. And the southern tribes are sometimes also referred to Israel, but primarily as Judah, comprising of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin, the capital being Jerusalem. By the way, sidebar. Jerusalem has always been the capital of Israel. It always will be the capital of Israel. And it doesn't matter who likes it or who doesn't like it. It doesn't matter who agrees or disagrees. Jerusalem has always been the capital of Israel. And so if you can't applaud Mr. Trump for anything else, applaud him for recognizing that historical fact. You see? So on we go. Now in 2 Kings chapter 18 and verse 1. Now it came to pass in the third year of Hoshea, king of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of Ahaz, king of Judah, began to reign. Twenty and five years old when he began to reign, and he reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Abai, the daughter of Zechariah. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. Well, that's a pretty good thing, isn't it? He did right. What an epitaph. That's a good one. You know, that wouldn't be a bad thing to be carved on your gravestone someday. He did right, or she did right. Wouldn't that be a blessing? I mean, that says a mouthful right there. That's volumes, all right? Well, now the Lord expands on what this right was. Right number one, verse four. He removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. Oh, a religious icon. The brazen serpent. And God said this guy did right. What was he doing right? He was busting up a religious icon. Shame on him. But he did. And the Lord said it was the right thing to do. For under those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Nehishtan. Alright, so what they had done is they had taken this brazen serpent. And I hope you remember the story. Israel, because of their disobedience, God allowed them to be invaded with poisonous serpents. And they're getting bit by the hundreds and the hundreds. And they're dying. And uh, Moses cries out to God and he says, what's the remedy, Lord? And the Lord says, here's the remedy. You make a brazen serpent and you lift it up on a pole. And when they look upon that, they shall live. Isn't that strange? Because a serpent, biblically, is always a picture of the devil, isn't it? So how in the world do you come up with a brazen serpent that aids and abets and renders relief? Well, of course, the New Testament gives us the answer. 
when it says, as the brazen serpent was lifted up, so shall the Son of Man be lifted up. In other words, the curse abides on the serpent, and Jesus Christ took our curse for us. When he was lifted up on the cross, he became, in a sense, equivalent to the serpent in that he assumed upon his own body and his own soul a curse so that you and I might find relief. Unfortunately, what these Jews had done is they had made an idol, a god, if you please, out of the brazen serpent. And Hezekiah acknowledged that, recognized that. He said, we can't deal with that anymore. We can't have that. So he said, break her up, boys, break her up. And they broke it up. Well, so he's doing right. Now, verse 5. Let me see. Let me see. I flipped one page too far. Isn't that interesting? Right here on the top left-hand part of page 578 is verse 5. I flip the page, right on the top of the left-hand column is verse 5. It's amazing, isn't it? All right, now, so verse 5. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Now, that is an amazing resume. God says, this guy, he's high quality, man. He's top drawer. He's blue ribbon. There's never been anybody exactly like him before. There won't be anybody after him exactly like him. That's pretty good. For he clave to the Lord and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. So his trust and his obedience at this point are absolutely, excuse me, absolutely impeccable. But that's not all. Verse 7. And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth, and he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. God prospered him, and Hezekiah said, you know, I'm done with the United Nations. That's what this is all about. The king of Assyria, he was the heavyweight in that whole part of the world. And every other country in that portion lended him some kind of allegiance and followed his lead and kowtowed his expectations. Except Hezekiah. He said, I'm done with the United Nations. Hmm. Do you suppose there's any validity whatsoever in Mr. Trump saying, why are we giving them all this money? He has said that. Why are we financing the major portion of their activity? Why are we doing this? Something to think about. I know I'm not supposed to be political, but sometimes it just gets the best of me. I can't help it. So he says, you know what? I'm not going to mess with you guys anymore. Verse 8, he smote the Philistines even unto Gaza and the borders thereof from the Tower of the Watchmen to the fenced cities. Now, the Philistines had encroached upon land and property that God had ordained by divine decree to be given to Israel. And so Hezekiah believes in a strong national defense and a strong military. So he says to the Assyrians, nuts to you. He says to the Philistines, you get back where you belong. Hmm. And all of this activity, God summarizes by, he did that which was right. Okay, can't argue with God. Or if you do, you'll lose. So he was willing to fight the enemy. Now verse 11. And the king of Assyria did carry away Israel into Assyria and put them in the Hala in Harbor by the river of Gazan and by the city of the Medes. So all of a sudden his neighbors, his northern cousins right up there, the ten northern tribes are in trouble. They have a difficulty. And uh, their problem, the root of their problem, Israel's that is, the northern tribes, is a spiritual problem. Verse 12. Because they obeyed not the voice of the Lord their God, but transgressed his covenant and all that Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded and would not hear them nor do them. So God makes it abundantly clear that the difficulty 
that uh, the northern tribes are experiencing by being captured by the king of Assyria and hauled off into captivity is due not to um, uh, lack of uh, national defense. It's not that due to a bad economy. It's not due to all of the things that the news media would try to convince you are the problems of any nation. It's due to a spiritual difficulty. It's spiritual in nature. The last thing in the world that ABC, NBC, CBS, or even Fox News wants to consider is that America may have a spiritual problem. That just isn't in their wheelhouse. But God says when you have national problems, it's a spiritual problem. Hmm. But then what does God know? So the neighbor is in trouble. The root of the problem is spiritual. But verse 13, Now in the fourteenth year of King Hezekiah did Sennacherib, king of Assyria, come up against all the fenced cities of Judah and took them. Okay, now all of a sudden the problem has crossed the border. What can you extrapolate from that? The problem has crossed the border. Some of you are still scratching your head. The problem has crossed the border. Don't you think it's appropriate to have good border defense? Now the argument is always, well, America is a land of immigrants. No one argues with that. My forefathers... We're immigrants. Weren't yours? Unless you're a Native American. And even they were immigrants at one time. The Lord didn't just dump them here on a Baptist parachute, you know. (laughs) Amen? Immigrants is not the issue. The issue is we want immigrants that want to become Americans. I just wrote a column about that, and I said, what we want is people to convert. And I gave you biblical evidence for that. Not convert to a religion, convert to Americanism. You see the difference? That's what we're looking for, people that want to become Americans. My forefathers desperately wanted to become Americans. And the proudest day of their life is when they were legitimately recognized as an American. So the problem came across the border. Without strong border defense, problems are going to come. They're going to come. The terrorists are going to infiltrate. And they did right here. They did right here. And so verse 14, the thing gets real dicey now. Real dicey. Look at it. And Hezekiah, king of Judah, sent to the king of Assyria, to Lashish, saying, I have offended. Return from me that which thou puttest on me will I bear. And the king of Assyria appointed unto Hezekiah, king of Judah, 300 talents of silver and 30 talents of gold. Now, here's the problem. Hezekiah is a good man. The Bible's told us. Best king they ever had. Good man. Hard to find any fault in him. But it happens to the best of us. Fear overcame convictions. Fear overcame convictions. And Hezekiah all of a sudden he sees this vast Assyrian army. And in his reasoning he thinks there's no way that we can defeat an army like that. And so... He capitulates to one of the most well-used, or I should say overused, buzzwords in liberal vocabulary. Offended. You know, every time a liberal gets on the television, they like to talk about, well, we're offended. And they have discovered that that word will pretty well get them what they want. 
You know, when I say to them, well, I'm offended that you're offended. The truth of the matter is, I don't care who's offended if they're offended at a godly biblical principle. Doesn't matter. I don't care. You see? Now, if I've offended them and it's a personal thing, that's one thing. But if the Lord offended them, tough apples. That's too bad. But Hezekiah, as good as he was, capitulated to the word offended. Uh, Oh, we've offended the king of Assyria. And so he caves into his fears and he says, okay, what is it that you want? Whatever you put on me, I'll bear it. And so the king of Assyria says, well, I want this much silver and I want this much gold. Hmm. You know, the Bible says money answereth all things. In other words, if you can't understand a thing, there's a buck in it. Right? Yeah, just go figure, you see. So, what does he do? This is wild. Verse 15, and Hezekiah gave him all the silver that was found in the house of the Lord and in the treasures of the king's house. At that time, did Hezekiah cut off the gold from the doors of the temple of the Lord and from the pillars, which Hezekiah, king of Judah, had overlaid and gave it to the king of Assyria. I'd call that a major concession, wouldn't you? Taking the gold and the silver out of the house of God and literally knocking the gold off the doors of the temple and surrendering it to this Assyrian pagan king. But fear, fear can be one of the most dominating, distressing emotions that the human in, uh, in the human experience. He feared greatly. So in the midst of that fear, he said, okay, whatever it is you want. But what a, what a concession. All of a sudden, the convictions were compromised. Have you ever compromised a conviction? Back up and take a look. Don't do it. If it's a genuine conviction. I don't have many convictions. I've told you about that. But I got a few. I got a few. One of my convictions is my allegiance to that book right there. There it is. I have a conviction about it. You say, well, would you be willing to die for it? I would ask God to give me the grace to be willing to do that. Others have. Have you ever read church history? Many have. For that book right there, you see. So... Yeah, I, I don't have a lot. I got a few. I got a few, but not many. All right, so <clears throat> what does he do? He says, okay, here, here. Here's a whole wagon load of silver and gold. And no sooner than that wagon is over on the other side of the mesa, and here they come back. It's inevitable. You begin to compromise a conviction. Now, I don't know if our president has convictions or he's just stubborn. But in either event, the liberals haven't quite figured out how to deal with him. Because historically, they're used to the right making all the compromises. That's, that's our history. You know, the left makes none. Let me ask you, when has the left ever compromised on abortion? Have they ever? No, they don't compromise on that. They have more convictions than the people on the right. And they're not willing to compromise on them, you see. So, all of a sudden you get a guy that says, I'm not going to go along with that. It just puts some... I mean, they're frothing at the mouth. Well, this is not a new event. This is not a new syndrome that we're looking at. This is historical all the way back to Bible days. I mean, and we have an example right here. Let's look and see what we got going on here. So verse 17, And the king of Assyria sent Tardin and Resheres 
and Rabshakeh, from Lachish to King Hezekiah with a great host against Jerusalem. And they went up and came to Jerusalem. And when they were come up, they came up and stood by the conduit of the upper pool, which is in the highway of the fuller's field. And when they had called to the king, there came out to them Elkiah, the son of Hilkiah, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe, and Joah, the son of Asaph, the recorder. And Rabshakeh said unto them, Speaking out of Hezekiah, thus saith the great king, the king of Assyria, What confidence is this wherein thou trustest? I mean, he just gave him a whole wagon full of gold and silver. And it's not but hours or days later, and here they are right back again, making further demands. Compromise of convictions never ends the way you hope it will. It's a downward spiral, man. It just keeps going down, down, down when you see that kind of thing going. Now, what I would like you to do today is assess your convictions. Ask yourself, how many do I have? (laughs) What are they? What would I be willing to die for? You know, I mean, what, what, what is so concrete in my life that I just absolutely cannot compromise it in any way, shape, or form. Because I will guarantee you, the enemy will not only be there trying to make you capitulate with a cloud of fear, but when you do, they will return. They will return. It's just, it's biblical is what it is. All right, so here we are. And so a dialogue goes on here between the representatives of the king of Syria and the representatives of Hezekiah. And you can read it when you go home for yourself. Read your Bible, man. There's there's some good stuff in here. Really, there is. And so we'll get down here to about verse 28. Then Rabshakeh stood and cried with a loud voice in the Jews' language and spake, saying, Hear the word of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. And so the accusation is one of deception. Anytime you purpose that you're going to base your life on biblical convictions, someone is going to come along and say, well, you've been fooled. You've been deceived. You've been led astray. There it is right there. That's what's going on. You, you see, it's, the, the, the problem is you don't see things clearly. No, the problem is you're seeing things very clearly if you're looking through the prism of the Word of God. The, the enemy understands the root of confidence and knows that to get you to cave in, to capitulate, the confidence must be undermined. Verse 30, Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord saying, The Lord will surely deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. All right, now their confidence had been built, legitimately so, on the Lord. The enemy. I'm talking about the principalities and powers. uh, And rulers of darkness and all that kind of invisible enemy. You know what they know? They know that our young people have to have their confidence shaken in the Word of God. The enemy knows that the confidence cannot rely and stay in the Word of God. It must be shaken somehow. Their confidence must be uh, misplaced to another place. Your confidence should be in education. It should be in cultural diversity. It should be in recycling. (laughs) You with me? It should be in the green movement. It should be in anything except what that Bible says. And so, there you go. Um, The tricks are old. They have been utilized for many, many generations. But then look at the appeal. This is great. Folks, Read your Bible. You'll get what's going on in the world today. These historical precedents are with us over and over again. Verse 31. 
Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig, of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards, a land of oil and um, uh, oil olive and of honey, that ye may live and not die. And hearken not unto Hezekiah when he persuaded you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. You see what the appeal is? I mean, folks, do you see it? You know what's going on here? The king of Assyria's representative says, Now, if you'll just listen to us, our government will take care of you. Did you get it? Our government will take care of you. Forget all this self-reliant stuff. Forget about this stuff of depending upon the Lord. Hezekiah has deceived you. He has led you astray. You need to compromise just like he compromised, you see. And and then there was an immediate admission to bondage and slavery. He said, now we're going to take you away from your homes. From the land of your nativity. But it'll be Disneyland. (laughs) It'll be great. You'll have your own vineyard and your own fig tree and your own olive oil. It'll be wonderful. And our government will take care of you. You getting it? Boy, oh boy, you can't. I I mean, this is folks. God knew what he was talking about long before it ever happened. So we get down here. Hezekiah says, oh, man, I'm really in a mess now. I'm in a fix. I'm between the rock and the hard spot. What in the world am I going to do? Well, Hezekiah, to some degree, had been practicing a, a very favorite Christian method of operation. Why pray when you can worry? Now, I didn't misstate that. Why pray when you can worry? We've all been guilty of that, haven't we? Haven't we all from time to time adopted that approach? (laughs) Why why pray when when I can just worry? (laughs) Well, Hezekiah finally comes to his senses and he says, you know what? I think it's time to pray. Chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass when King Hezekiah heard it that he rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. And he sent Eliakim, which was over the household, and Shebna the scribe and elders of the priests covered with sackcloth to Isaiah the prophet, the son of Amos. So they said, you know what? Maybe we ought to get God's prophet in on this act and see what he's got to say about this whole gig, you know. So, uh, and they said unto him, thus saith Hezekiah, This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and blasphemy, for the children are come to the birth, and there is not strength to bring forth. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of the Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria his master has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God hath heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. So the servants of King Hezekiah came to Isaiah. Well... Never, never, never forsake the wonderful option and opportunity of prayer. God still is alive. You know, many, many years ago, some of you are old enough to remember some theological, liberal theological seminary down south somewhere. I don't even remember where they were. Some professor finally declared, and the seminary, I guess, endorsed his thought. He said, God is dead. You remember that? The God is dead movement. My old black preacher friend, S.M. Lockridge, had the perfect answer for that. I loved what he said. He said, now, uh, now they say that God is dead. He said, I don't believe that so because I hasn't been notified and I was a member of the family. <laughs> <laughs> I said, amen, brother, amen. He said, furthermore, I ain't seen his obituary in a newspaper. (laughs) I said, amen. Well, there are those that would like you to believe that, but God isn't dead. And so, 
Verse 6, Isaiah said unto them, Thus shall ye say to your master, Thus saith the Lord, Be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servant of the king of Assyria hath blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor, and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. So Isaiah gives reassurances that prayer really works. It really works. But about the time you go to the Lord in prayer and, and, and you're really trying to get your, your trust button back where it needs to be, you know, okay, I'm going to trust in the Lord, then another front arises. Verse 8. So Rabshakeh returned and found the king of Assyria warring against Libna, for he had heard that he had departed from Lachish. And when he heard, say, of uh, Terica, king of Ethiopia, behold, he has come out to fight against thee. He sent messengers again unto Hezekiah, saying, Thus shall you speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah, saying, Let not thy God in whom thou trustest deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? And so even though the king of Assyria gets temporarily sidetracked on another front that he's in a war in, uh, he sends a messenger back and says to Hezekiah and the people of uh, Jerusalem, he says, you folks need to breathe through your nose. Don't think that you're delivered. We're coming back. This is just a minor little skirmish that we're dealing with over here. It's a minor difficulty and inconvenience, but we'll be back. And so don't you be deceived into thinking that your God is greater than our God's. And so Hezekiah says, oh, man, oh, man, oh, man. I mean, put yourself in the position of these people. These are real people. This is real history. This really happened. And so in verse 14, Hezekiah finally says, man, I sent some of my emissaries over to Isaiah the prophet to pray. And he prayed. And now we still got a problem. Hezekiah finally says, I guess I need to get serious myself. You know, it's one thing to ask other folks to pray for you, and that's profitable and it's biblical and right to do. But sometimes you just got to get down to your own prayer business, your own prayer life. You got to get down to where the rubber meets the road, as it were. You can't depend on anyone else to carry the same burden to God that you have. And so you just got to get honest with the Lord and say, okay, Lord, it's you and me. And let me visit with you a little bit about this. And so verse 14, Hezekiah received the letter of the hand of the messengers and read it. And Hezekiah went up into the house of the Lord and spread it before the Lord. He took the letter, the message, and he spread it right there on the altar before the Lord, you know. And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwellest between the cherubims, thou art the God, even thou alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, thou hast made heaven and earth. Lord, bow down thine ear and hear, open, Lord, thine eyes and see, and hear the words of Sennacherib, which hath sent him to reproach the living God. Of a truth, Lord, the kings of Assyria have destroyed the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire, for they were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they have destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord, our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Now, that's not a particularly long prayer. It's only five verses. But it's a sincere prayer. It's a real prayer. It's right down there where, where the cow can get the cabbage kind of prayer. You know, that's where this prayer is. God, I know you're greater than all that's around us. Oh God, please incline your ear, incline your eye to our plight and respond accordingly. Now, in verse 20, then Isaiah, the son of Amos, sent to Hezekiah, saying, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel. And he went on to deliver a message. Here's what's neat about that. Hezekiah prayed five verses. God answers in triplicate. God answers with 15 verses. If you read the whole message. In other words, <clears throat> you get serious with God in prayer. He's willing to listen. And he's willing to respond three times over to your effort. He answers in triplicate. Wow. Okay. Fifteen verses. 
Now, <clears throat> the whole thing's getting pretty interesting. Time for prayer. God's listening. Here's the answer. Verse 32. Therefore, thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with shield, nor cast a bank against it. By the way that he came, by the same shall he return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. So that's the answer. God said, okay, not to worry. I got it under control. Oh, man. Easy to hear, hard to believe. The old preacher said the thing about the Bible is it's not all that hard to read. Some people say, well, I have a hard time reading the Bible. Yeah, but I mean, come on, really now. 70% of the words in my old King James Bible are one-syllable words. Now, you can't read a book that's 70% one-syllable words. I mean, come on. It's not that hard to read. And the old preacher said, the thing about the Bible is it's not hard to read. It's not hard to understand. Now, I'll grant you, there are a few places that are a little difficult. Our 14-year-old granddaughter, Molly, said to me, I'm going to brag on her a little bit. Why not? You brag on your grandkids. <laughs> She's on her second time through reading the Bible. She asked me over Christmas time, we were having a family function. She said, uh, those spinning wheels and all that stuff over in Ezekiel, what's that all about? Man, you know what my answer was? Beats a fire out of me. <laughs> I've been looking at that stuff for years. <laughs> I, 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 got to, I can speculate, but I'm not sure. But I know it's in the book and someday God will reveal it to us. But you see what that stuff is? That's the exception. The spinning wheels of Ezekiel. That, I mean, that's, granted, that's far out, boy. That's the exception. But how about, uh, and this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the life, he that hath the Son hath life. And he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. How hard is that? You know, the old preacher said, he said, the Bible's not hard to read. And it's not really hard to understand for the most part. But he said the hard thing about the Bible is hard to believe. I'd say amen. Now, all of a sudden, God says, I'll tell you what, not to worry, Hezekiah. Everything's under control. <laughs> Where's my paper sack? I need to breathe in it a while. <sighs> oh, man, you know, yeah. Oh, oh, oh. If only I could believe that. Verse 35. How many of you know what God provided for a remedy? How many of you know the end of this story? I saw one hand. I see two hands. I have three, four, five. I got half a dozen hands here. Man, the rest of you need to read your Bible. Verse 35. And it came to pass that night that the angel of the Lord went out. Uh-oh, watch out. The angel of the Lord's on the loose. And smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred, fourscore, and five thousand. That's 185,000. And when they arose early in the morning, obviously these guys aren't arising. It's the remnant, whatever's left. In the morning, behold, they were all dead corpses. God said, no big deal. The angel of the Lord went out one night, 185,000 of them were just deader than a wedge. You think God's under, got it all under control? So Sennacherib, king of Assyria, departed. I'll bet he did. <laughs> I'll bet he did. Post haste. Now, <clears throat> as we conclude, a couple of quick lessons. Hezekiah, a good man, good man, 
I'm looking forward to meeting him in heaven. I'm sure he's there. Good king. But he allowed fear to overcome his convictions and he compromised. It wasn't necessary. Had he not compromised, do you suppose that God could have sent the angel of the Lord out a little earlier than he did? And then the gold on the temple door and in the house of the Lord would have been preserved. Now, gold in your Bible is fit for a king and gold is a picture of worship. You remember the three wise men came searching for Jesus and one of the gifts that they brought was what? Gold. And that gold is a demonstration of acknowledging Jesus Christ as king and their worship of him. You know what happened? Their compromise diluted their worship. Compromise will always delude worship. That's why I'm not willing to compromise a lot of music. It deludes worship. Even though it's done in the name of worship. When you just keep singing the same 11 words seven times over, it deludes worship. The stuff we sing is full of Bible doctrine, man. Bible doctrine. The reason I'm not willing to compromise that book is it deludes worship. I want to hang on to all the gold God gives us, don't you? I like gold. I wish I had a ton of it. I don't, so don't mug me in the parking lot. But I I wish I did. Don't you? I mean, gold has always, from Genesis chapter 2 to this day been valuable it always will be why gold is a picture of worship true worship is valuable and true worship begins when you acknowledge jesus christ not only to be king of kings and lord of lords but acknowledge him to be savior of the world as was announced by the angels of old and if you receive him as your savior and trust him then you're getting in on the gold that's where, that's where the action is. Isn't that right? Amen. That's where the action is. I'm not a gold miner. We've had people in our church, and it's a hobby, and it's fine. I, I don't fault it. They, they, they hobby in panning for gold. My fear is I wouldn't recognize it and throw it away. <laughs> When I was just a little lad about that high, my dad introduced me to fishing in the creeks and streams of Colorado. The first stream that in my conscious memory we fished, that I remember, was over by Gunnison. We went up there every year and there was a larger stream called Quartz Creek and then we'd go up to a smaller stream called Gold Creek. That name stuck in my head. Gold Creek. And while I was supposed to be looking for rainbow trout, I was more interested in finding gold. I was just a little chafer. I wasn't very big. But I remember seeing down in the crystal clear water of Gold Creek a shiny object. And I reached down to pick it up, and it just sparkled and shined in the sun. And I said, it's gold. I couldn't wait to show it to my dad, who was just a little ways upstream from me. And I ran up through the weeds and I said, Dad, Dad, we're rich. I found it. I mean, it was a gold nugget that filled my entire hand, my six or seven year old hand at that time. I said, look, we're rich. He took it and very patiently said, son. He said, that's not gold. Well, it looks like gold. It shines like gold. It's got a gold color. He said, son, that's iron pyrite. Otherwise known as fool's gold. A lot of fool's gold out there. Hang on to the real deal. Go for the real deal. Amen. Amen. Don't compromise. Biblical. 
convictions. Let's stand for prayer.